Hey folks, last week was chock full of exciting announcements and demos at E3. We were thrilled at the showing of Unreal Engine teams. There were so many games we can't wait to get our hands on. With over 75 games on display at the show, the annual challenge of selecting our Unreal E3 award winners was monumental. From heavy hitters like Borderlands 3 and the Final Fantasy VII remake to small yet mighty showings from Way to the Woods and Creature in the Well, we had the privilege of speaking to teams of all sizes and going hands-on with many of their passion projects. Dive into our E3 29 recap to find out who's taking home top honors and receiving prizes from our great partners NVIDIA and Intel. Epic Games CTO Kim Library is something of a legend in the visual effects industry, with film credits including The Matrix and the Oscar-winning What Dreams May Come. In our latest Virtual Disruptors podcast, FX Guide's Mike Seymour talks with Kim about how virtual production techniques are changing the face of VFX pipelines, how his team has advanced Unreal Engine technology by pushing it beyond its limits on, a, on special projects such as A Boy and His Kite, Hellblade Sinuous Sacrifice, Meet Mike, Siren, and the new Chaos demo and they discuss the importance of the annual Real-Time Live. To wrap things up, Kim shares what he believes is next for Epic Games and real-time technology. Listen to the full podcast or read the blog for an overview. We're excited to announce the official launch of the new and improved Unreal online learning site. Now it's easier than ever to learn Unreal Engine and level up your real-time skills. Whether you're an advanced UE artist or developer, or you're completely new to the engine, you'll find courses designed to help you get the most out of Unreal at your own pace. Find curated learning paths, earn points and badges and more. Check it out and let us know what you think. Released into early access in December, Contractors has become a fan favorite VR shooter. Developed by the four-person Caveman Studio, the game features some of the best graphics for a multiplayer VR shooter with polished looking gun models and a full body inverse kinematic system coupled with smooth performance. In our interview, the team shares tips on how they achieved the game's high visual fidelity while keeping VR's steeper performance requirements in check, how they designed a shooter around VR strengths and weaknesses and more. Formed in a Canadian basement two years ago, Vancouver-based Precision OS is now a flourishing business that provides orthopedic surgical training in virtual reality. After years at Radical Entertainment, Black Box Games, and the industry giant EA, the team wanted something different. Since making a mistake in the operating room could have significantly grave consequences, the team now helps ensure that orthopedic surgeons get to practice on virtual patients before they operate on real ones. Space Sandbox game Astroneer has been a popular indie title that's been in the works for years. And while it has officially launched, System Era Softworks isn't resting on its laurels and plans to continually update and improve the game. We sat down with creative director Adam Brommel and engineer Sam Wolpert to discuss how they designed Astroneer, implemented stylized graphics within a procedurally generated world, and overcame technical challenges over the course of its development. Whether you're training paratroopers to identify reference points for new drop zones or predicting the path of airborne hazards, the accuracy and realiz realism of your simulation is critical. That's just one of the reasons Booz Allen Hamilton turned to Unreal Engine. Learn more about the company's impact on fields from government and defense to healthcare and energy and how they're using Unreal to do so. Now onto our weekly karma earners. Many, many thanks to Every Nun, Indie Game Cove, Shadow River, Nebula Games Inc., That Light Worker, T. Sumisaki, Maxim Nosotov, Xander Rake, and Ted Undead. If you'd like your shot at your name up here, head on over to Answer Hub and help out your fellow devs. First up on our spotlight lineup is Zed by Eager Games. Zed is the story of an aging artist that is lost in regret and the haze of dementia. Inside the dreamscape of this creative mind comes undone, and then players reassemble the artist's fragmented memories into a final lasting legacy, a loving gift to his granddaughter. Next up is a beautiful interior scene. The artist has really showcased a stunning interior here. The layout is well balanced, and they're leveraging ray tracing to really make it pop. Nice work. And last but not least is Lux. This project from the University of Hertfordshire is a final year project made by two students with a little help from freelancers. Lux is a local co-op puzzle game. What you're seeing here is a vertical slice and I'd say the pair are off to a fantastic start. 
Thanks for joining us for our news and community spotlight. Have a great week. Hey everyone, welcome to another episode of the Unreal Engine live stream. I'm your host, Victor Broden, and with me on the couch, I have a familiar face that some of you might have seen before, Mr. Sam Dider. What's up, everybody? Our, one of our instructors on the uh, Unreal Engine learning team, education yeah, team? Yeah, education team. Yeah, something like that. They make a lot of the content that we all learn from, and that's why we're also here today, because we are going to talk about how to debug your game. Oh, before we get into that, I want to mention that if you saw our community spotlights, uh, we will be handing out keys to Zed, which if you're one of the lucky few to get to play it, make sure you play it, because it's going to be great. I think. Looks great. Anyway. Um, with further ado, yeah, so we are going to talk about how to debug your game. This will mostly be around blueprints and the tools that we have in the engine that can help you tr troubleshooting. Uh, we're also going to mention a little bit about a uh, few guides and ways that you can um, prepare yourself for yeah, success. Like approach, how to think about debugging your project. Because um, it's more than just like throwing something in there and checking for value, right? Yeah. So we've got some good stuff in store for you guys today. Although that happens as well. That does happen. Yeah. I was saying that. I was like, ah, yeah, it kind of happens, but there's a, there's a rhyme and a reason. So we'll uh, we'll get dive into that a little bit here in a second. So yep yep, uh, we have prepared a slide. So I think we'll just start off with that, um, and we will go over some of the topics. Move the mouse out of the way. So first we've got prepare. Um, I think you actually did this one. I, d I did this so one. Yeah, I'm, I'm gonna let you take the lead on this. I was like, uh, wait, uh, that's not that, that's not my that's not my point there. Yeah. So a few of the points there I wanted to point out is that preparing yourself for sort of I should call it easy troubleshooting. You will always have bugs. You will always have problems. There will always things will break. They will go wrong. And occasionally they're very small and simple mistakes. Um, preparing yourself and your project uh, and setting it up in a way that helps you identify them quickly is something that I think a lot about um, nowadays when, when I, I make my projects. And one of the key things to that, especially if you're working on a team, is to use a style guide. And this style guide can be, it, like, there are good style guides, there are bad style guides, but the most important thing is that you actually use one and that you stay consistent. Um, like I said, we weren't going to mention too much of C++ or, 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 or sort of deep debugging, but a style guide helps you so much uh, when it comes to like finding assets that might have been corrupted, um, just knowing what you're looking for, because eventually everything, you know, deep down, it's just a, a, a file path or, or a name, right? You don't have any nice icon in the content browser or anything else that, that you can look at. When things go wrong, all you're looking at is text. For uh, those who aren't aware, when he's talking about style guide, um, we mean a style guide for how your project should be set up and assets should be named. Um, there are many different types of style guides out there, but there is both visual and written style guides, um, just in case those who might not be aware what we're talking about. <laughs> um, but I do like your, uh, your point here. It's better to be consistent, even if the initial naming conventions are bad. Yep. Uh, I think consistency is is easier, especially when you're debugging, because mm -hmm. you'll you even if you do have a really long variable name, at least you can actually instead of checking for that name, you can check. Well, it's the really long one. You know, I don't remember what it is, but it's the one that's like sixteen carats, or sixteen, <laughs> sixteen carats, <laughs> sixteen, sixteen carats. characters long. Yeah, and uh, one of the style guides that I personally use is one that one of our community members, Aller, yeah, Aller yeah. wrote, it's and a very good one. mainly. Uh, you know, there might be reasons why you'd want to have the prefix, and the prefix is the sort of the, the first um, first couple of characters of of the name of your asset. And you know, there might be reasons why you don't want to follow that precisely. But what I did learn a lot about from that style guide is project hi or folder hierarchy in your project. And when you start scaling your project, um, when you start scaling your project, having consistency there and so will help you a lot, especially just managing it. Because when you're up to a couple thousand assets, it's there. there's a lot of just sort of folder browsing and going about. And um, if you if you bring so a contractor on your team or someone else who uh, continues to work on it, it's much easier if they can just go and, and sort of read the style guide and see, oh, this is how, or even if it follows you know, one that they've used before, it will be much faster for them to get up to speed with the project. Uh, always make sure you comment your code. It, it doesn't really matter how how little. Just just all the details you can you can pipe in there. 
or even as little if you don't have much just comment it it makes it more legible it's easier to get a overview look of what your logic is doing and then uh, last point under the prepare is to make your game modular uh, and I, I like to phrase that code is for humans uh, eventually the computer just reads zeros and ones that's what we uh, compile down to it's it's for us right we need to read it we need to understand it and we're the ones working with it so preparing your game and making making it modular it's much easier to find you know oh it breaks in 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 this class instead of oh i have uh, several thousands of, of of nodes and now and i know some people will say that you shouldn't have several thousands of blueprint nodes in uh in, in one class but it is possible you can do it uh it, it all runs and so keeping logic um, in separate classes, uh, whether those are actor components, scene components, actors, uh, other various objects, will help you track down issues faster instead of just the output log saying, oh, it broke somewhere in the event graph. That's a little tricky to track down, and I've been there myself, and it's not some, you, you'd rather be, uh, stay out of that. Um, our second point is think. Do you know what's failing? Sort of, sort of ask yourself these questions before you just start adding breakpoints everywhere and, and, and piping in more print strings than you had when you initially wrote the logic. Do you know what's failing? Uh, it, are you looking for a number or a reference? Why isn't it working? And don't go with your gut and always, always double check your work. The amount of times that I have accidentally left an execution node, even when I went to package the game and nothing is working, and you're going like, oh no, you know, the engine is broke and there are bugs everywhere and, and it's just no you just forgot to to plug it back yeah in. definitely make sure you are you know why something is working and don't just assume um, because it could have been that you wired something backwards or maybe you miswired something and it's it, it's working because it's actually broken yeah so to speak so when you undo it it actually doesn't work anymore um, that's probably one of the most important things to debugging is don't just base your guess off of a hunch. You make sure you have uh, an answer, or at least something to figure out what's, ca uh, what's causing the problem. Um, and don't just, I think it's this because of this. You know, if, if you think that is, and make sure you investigate it, but don't, um, don't rely on your gut instinct of why the bug is happening, um, because it can often lead you down a path of, of a heartache and sorrow when it okay. doesn't actually do what you want. <laughs> If it's something quick, you know, you're just like, oh, I had this, or, or you know, it happened before, then, you know, if it's something quick to act on, you can certainly yeah, do that. Yeah. Just don't go breaking everything on that hunch, essentially, is, I guess yeah, is what we're trying to say. Yep, pretty much. And then, then it's just, you know, time to execute. Be scientific in the way that you approach your, your problems. I think we can go to the next slide. I just, I like three, and so I, I put execute there in the, in the end. Um, Yep, that, that's part of the slide. I didn't actually, I didn't have time to grab a rubber duck image, but just imagine one here. Uh, if you are not familiar with the concept of rubber ducking, it, is, it comes from some programmer back in the day who uh, had a rubber duck on his desk, and he started explaining his problem to the rubber duck. And this is, has nothing to do with the entity that you're talking to. This is just for your synapses to, f they fire differently when you start speaking the pro problem out loud. I I can even list on my fingers and toes how many times I've started writing a question in like Unreal Sackers, and as I'm writing the question, I figured out what the problem is. Yeah, that's a, that's a common. Yeah. Is he common? I've exhausted all my resources, I type up the email, then I'm like, oh, you know what, let me try this. Oh, it worked. That was it. Yeah. Yep, that's exactly how it, it goes. So. And so, whether you prefer a rubber duck or any other sort of entity, maybe even imaginary, <laughs> but... Speaking it out loud, or in this case, typing it, can really help you. When when you're so stuck, you just you you you, you don't even have any other like scientific steps to take in your troubleshooting path. It's just you're just stuck. That's when I I really like to. It also helps when you're trying to figure out a logic issue. So if it's a bug or a bug with logic, because they're two different things, but they both result in code that doesn't really work in right. the desired way. Um, speaking things out loud can really help you step through the problem uh, and expose things that you might not necessarily have thought about before. Um, this is why you say it out loud to somebody else um, or an inanimate object. Mm -hmm. um, I prefer talking to somebody else because I am not a fantastic programmer, so it, uh, it helps to, you know, 
when you're talking to a programmer or someone who's experienced, more experienced than I am, uh, when they kind of help you connect your ideas together, I want to do this. They're like, mm -hmm. oh, what you're talking about is like 2D vector math on, you know, um, uh, I was talking to one of the programmers about trigonometry, and he's like, this whole thing is called like vec surfaces, and, you know, type this, look up this one specific part of it, because it's really difficult to figure out something that you don't know the right question to ask. Right. Which can be one of the most, it's one of the, I think, toughest problems in video game development is literally trying to figure out how to figure out what's wrong when you don't know how to ask what's wrong to figure out what's wrong. It's, it's a very difficult question to, or a very difficult thing to overcome, I should say. And, and usually someone who is not, who's not working on your project and they're not sort of aware of your logic and your problem, they will start asking some very basic questions if, if they're a good troubleshooter. And those basic questions can also also either lead them to finding the problem really quick because you might be so so into it that you're yeah. not thinking about the sort of the first couple of initial steps of what have you been doing. You know, keep calm, look for the checkbox kind of <laughs> yeah kind of deal. Um, and that obviously depends on if it's a tool that it's not working the way you intended to, or if it's actually your logic. Um, that's the concept of rubber ducking. Very very useful. Uh, next slide. And yeah, let's get into some of the uh, options that we have in, en in in the editor. So print string, this is going to be your bread and butter. I mean, whether you're a C++ programmer doing something outside of um, Unreal, like mm -hmm. you work for Tesla and you are writing code, uh, print string is, is just, it's your bread and butter for debugging. So it is not a bad way or a lame way to go about debugging. It is the way that most people will end up doing it because it's very fast. Um, you can color code the text. And there's pretty much, there are very few things you can't actually print a string out to um, or hook up something to print out a string to. Um, I use this for everything. Like it, it, there are so many, I can't even, think of how many times that I use debug print string for literally everything. Like um, one good thing is we're going to show you a mobile project like on your device, um, like on my phone here. You can't, um, uh, like it's really hard to tell if you've done a, a, a tap or not, you know, an input touch. Mm -hmm. So it's really easy on your input touch to just add, like I usually, one of the first things I add is on event begin play or like when the touch first happens, mm -hmm. I add a little bit of, uh, a print string right there just to put a text that says like input touch. So I know that my touch is working because without your touch working, without knowing that the touch is working, you're like, right. wait, is there something wrong with my phone? Does it not have enough battery? Mm -hmm. Is it something with the screen? Is there something in Unreal? You know, like what is, is it my screen protector? Yeah. And my wife's got like six screen protectors on her phone because <laughs> she's super clumsy. So you have to like really tap on the screen to, to make things happen. Um, but having that knowing that right off the bat, like, boom, okay, I definitely know that the input is being sent out, so this is somewhere past that point. Um, you know, and I leave those in there for the lifetime of my project until I'm, actually, I, I never take them out. And that's, um, I want to get, brings us back to sort of the, the prepare part of it. Whenever I'm writing um, multiplayer code, I leave, I leave all of those prints, they're always in there, right? So. Um, when I create a session, when I'm looking for session, I will add a print that like this is what's going on so that when I go back and I am reading through one of the, the logs of the uh, development build, I can see that, oh, the, the widget button that is supposed to create the session, it fired. It, I, I actually ran the function of trying to create a session and then, oh, it failed. Okay, so, so I, I, I know, or if it just dies, terror crashes for whatever reason, at least I know until which point my logic is working. And that uh, boils down a little bit to what I've done at the bottom of the slide here, which is the uh, macro that I almost tend to set up in, in every single actor that I working, uh, work in, which is to have a Boolean that I call debug visibility. And I will have a macro that I call debug print string, just so that it's different from the, uh, from the function name of print string. And this allows me to leave all of my print strings as part of the logic and I can just, oh, I'm done debugging, my logic works, I can go ahead and toggle that bool to false, and then the next time when I discover, I maybe I iterated a little bit, and 
I possibly adjusted some logic that affects some other logic. I can then just simply, instead of going back and, oh, I got added a string here again, and you know, you can, you can have a bunch of appends mm -hmm. that is added to, which I think we're going to show in, in the project later what an append is. And I will have to go and add them back, back again and sort of write in little explanations, sort of doing the multi-line print strings. And this is just an easy way that you don't have to, oh, I'm done, delete all the strings, make sure the execution lines are hooked up again. Uh, none of that work matters. You can just leave this in there and use that Boolean to toggle uh, print the screen on and off. Uh, just as a side note, if you do, I think this, this is more useful if you're actually writing uh, print strings in C++, but if, if you add warning, uh, colon as the first step and same with error, that will actually color the text in the output log, oh, which can be really okay. useful. Yeah, so that's what, when you see the warnings, they're yellow, you see the, the errors, they're red, that's because they start with warning and error. Uh, one thing to note too, don't forget that print string literally just prints a string and your space counts as a character. So don't forget to, if you're like in his string input right here, if we're doing something like I might do my, what I do personally is my value colon and then a space, so I will see my value colon, and that space right there is super important because without it, whatever I'm trying to look for will be pushed right up against the colon. This just makes it a little easier to parse that information. Also, if I want to extract all that stuff out of the out of the text file without having to do like some Python stuff, I know that I can look for because the space again counts as a character space whatever that thing that I'm okay. looking for, and then I can just do like find all of those or cut all of those out. Um, you know, these are things to think about when you're doing this, you know, because maybe, maybe it will take you longer to write a Python script than it would to do all that stuff by hand. Right. But if you just think a little bit about how you're going to do things and put a little bit of forethought into like, okay, so I'm not very good at Python scripting, but how can I do this with control F? Like, what am I really using Python to do? And it's just mm -hmm. basically to get rid of data, to give you a data in a more usable format. So how can I do this? Maybe I have to do it in two or three steps instead of just one, but that beats you know spending weeks learning Python to not be able to actually do what it is that I want to do. Mm -hmm. But I spend maybe two or three. Uh, it takes me two or three clicks to do it instead of fifty, right? You yeah. Know, because I got a little clever with my debug output. This, that's similar to how I search for assets sort of in, in Explorer, not in the content browser, and that's why the prefix for yeah, assets like is SM very important. Yeah, and so one that I tend to, because I usually experiment with particles here and there, and I might not be so consistent where I put them, and I'm like, oh, where, where, all, where are all of the particles that I was just iterating on that I should delete now because I want to minimize the size of my build? I, c I just go P underscore. That's all I search for. And by the way, shout out to a to tool called Everything. Ah, uh, yeah. Uh, it, it's... It, Gives you an it's an amazing indexing. I, I totally should put that on. <laughs> yeah, on one the slide. The, one of the things that I install there's two programs I install uh, that and then this thing called Sage Thumbs and Sage Thumbs. I don't Thumbs, know what that is. Sage Thumbs shows you targas inside of Windows Explorer as thumbnail images. Okay. So it's called S A G E Thumbs. Um, it's a little hard to find because it's it's a little bit older. Um, I think you can get it from SourceForge. Is that the software? The, it's yeah, one yeah. of them. Yeah, 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 it's one of them. Um, that and then everything basically indexes your entire computer. In seconds. Uh, well, it takes a little while to index it, but to access the index, you get it like um, on Mac OS. They have their, I forgot the name of their search bar. Yeah, I don't know either. But it's just like, it's. I was explaining it to somebody, and they're like, oh, so it's like such and such on Mac. And I'm like, I, I guess yeah. it sounded pretty much the same because it, once it's done indexing, and I have, it, I have three drives on my computer here at work. Uh, and two at home, and you know, I have like two and a half terabytes of storage here at work, and it, whatever it is that I'm looking for, like I do a lot of stuff with um, uh, the Infinity Blade assets, but I always forget the name of the project that I put the assets in. So just like you, I'm like Infinity Blade, like Hambone, because that's the name of one. That's the name of the big meat, mm -hmm. the big meat sword. It's called the Hambone because it looks like a ham with a bone in it, and. Then I find that, then I find the project. I'm like, oh yeah, it's in four, actually just remembered what it's in. It's in like 419 features, whatever. That's the thing that I imported into. So yeah, everything makes it super easy to, um, to find pretty much everything as the name implies. That's great. Um, and then when it comes to print strings on tick, they're fine, <coughs> they're fine to put there, but there are a few things that will help you when you're doing that. Something that I like is to set duration to zero, because it will essentially just, instead of just blow up, and it will just keep printing, you know, default is two. 
you can see one line. And now if you have eight actors all printing something on tick, you can actually see them all at the top. Oh, yeah, and then idea. all of your print strings that are sort of uh, individual events, like I executed this, and now we want to display for two seconds, that will be displayed right below, which is really useful. And then my final tip there is just don't print to log if you're printing on tick. <laughs> there are many reasons why. Main one is that if you have a long like play test, your yeah, log file will be huge, file. huge, and it will seriously impact the performance. And so you might start thinking that you have performance problems when all it's actually related to is the fact that you're you're printing strings. Well, yeah, and your players could could say, you know, as I play the game more and more, my performance degrades more yep. and more, and it's because it's trying to write all this stuff in the log files like three gigs, and then it's four gigs, and uh -huh. then it's five gigs, then it's ten gigs. Now it's bigger than the eval amount of RAM that they physically have in their computer. So now what, what does it do? I actually am not sure what happens there. It would crash. <laughs> That's great. Uh, so I think that covers, covers print string. We're definitely going to go ahead and use it, sh show it in a little bit. Draw debug, extremely useful. Uh, I like to use them. I think I use them more when I do VR development than, than flat game development. Yeah, I've, I use these. What if I use these for? Um, I use them in action RPG to figure out um, Ah, I was trying to make some explosion damage just to find out that we use a different type of system so the stuff isn't hooked up to the standard, okay. like, you know, um, velocity and things like that. Um, but I got super complex with the debug sphere. I was drawing it, like, every tick where it was going because I'm like, why is there no damage happening here? Mm -hmm. like, and then some things were getting damaged, but that was actually a bug in the code. So, <laughs> But, yes, these are super... Um, actually, in one of the VR tutorials, when you... Uh, plot your play space around you, mm -hmm. like your uh, Vive interaction area, you use the uh, draw debug, uh, I think it's the draw debug line, or box, I'm not sure if it's the box or the line, but basically to plot out, you get the chaperone's so location, yeah. and then you plot a box around that. That's pretty cool. And then um, I use the debug, the draw debug box, to basically draw where an action RPG again, when the player vanquishes an enemy, he spawns a bunch of loot, and it just basically makes a box in space and then picks a random spot within that box okay. to spawn it. But I didn't understand that. I didn't understand what it was doing, so I set up what it was doing with the draw debug box so I could better understand what it was doing in the world because it was basically like a one-for-one -one kind of swap. So, yeah, these things are incredibly useful. Yeah, because the visual representation of what you're doing can really help us humans understand what's going on. And you, you occasionally need that. And these are very useful tools um, to be able to do that. If we go to the next slide, here's something. Uh, actually, the two, you know, you want to go uh, one more after the console? Keep going. OK, keep going, because I want to bring this up right now. Keep going. <laughs> uh, keep going. There we go. OK, so uh, I guess there could have been more meat here. But anyway, I do I think it, it's, it's a good mention to bring up the visual logger. And there was not really any need for us to go over this here because there is an amazing uh, talk done by one of the developers from Rare, uh, Andy Sable. He goes over how they use the visual logger in, uh, in Sea of Thieves, I believe. W and essentially, just a quick breakdown of what it does. It allows you to record uh, whether oh, they yeah, are locations yeah. or uh, lines, directions um, during during runtime, and then you will actually see a representation of those debug draws afterwards. It's basically, if you've ever heard of something called heat mapping, it's pretty yeah, much Yeah, that's it's precisely yeah, what yeah, you're yeah, using yeah. for. Heat mapping is most, uh, I'd say the first time I heard it was in reference to Counter-Strike, where the level designers were figuring out where players spent the most time, where they died most often, and sort of, uh, and, and, and so you use that heat mapping to, to get an idea of how the, the game actually plays out. You know, after several thousands of playthroughs, you get a pretty accurate heat map of where action takes place, and you can use that information to yeah, improve on your uh, on your level design. One of the first first games that I worked on was called Stargate Resistance, and it was a third person um, Stargate game, shoot okay. up game, and we used heat maps uh, to figure out like basically how big we should make the levels. Like, what are the max the the max extents where people were playing? We found out that like you know there'd be Basically, a lot of, depending on how wide the uh, the hallway was, the first person to enter the hallway would be, like, the person that's always going to win the battle. Or, like, things that we just didn't think of or, um, 
what else did we find? Oh, man, there's so many things that we found out. We found out that uh, if we increase the jump height by just a, a little bit, we uh -huh. ended up making the sniper rifle less deadly. Like, it, it just insane things that you never thought that you were going to, um, that just, I didn't think that that was a thing or something like that, uh, can be found with, with heat map data. It's, it's really, really useful data, especially when you're debugging, um, because it can bring you insights to how people are using your, your product that you never thought were possible before. Yeah, and... Yeah, and watch the video. It goes. Th it um, he goes through a lot of it, how they use it, and why. Um, console commands. So if you're not familiar and you're just starting out, the console is essentially our way of inputting, the telling the computer to do things without actually sort of writing any logic it's to do that. It's it's accessing, or I should say, it's enabling and disabling pre-existing logic. Yeah that you can access on the fly. So, uh, for example, all these little memory charts over here only come up when you put in the stat command for them. And they're constantly going in the background, but the stat command br invokes them uh, so that you can see what they are, and then you can get rid of them uh, when you no longer need to have them. And I've, I put a couple of, the, I think, the ones that I use the most on yeah. the screen and something that we actually figured out <laughs> like yeah. th th two hours ago was that shift L will actually, uh, when you have the 3D viewport in the editor in focus, you can use shift L to toggle all of these on and off. So you can actually keep the ones that you like to view the most instead of having to type them in every time. And you can use shift L to toggle them on and off, which is really useful. I haven't actually tried if that works in a development build yet. It could. Probably. But but I don't know. So if someone if someone knows, someone wants to try it out, that'd be great. We did not have time for that right before the stream, but I definitely will uh, right after because I I thought that was a really neat key bind. And and the same goes with the other ones. If you are toggling stat FPS all the time or you know stat scene rendering, you can actually uh, assign those to uh, to keys. Yeah, uh, some of that stuff I actually do right at the beginning on event begin play. I just assign it to console command and I'll do you know stat FPS mm -hmm. and stat unit just so that they're on all the time when the game is, especially if I'm doing anything with VR. That's the first thing that I ever put on is um, stat unit or stat and or stat FPS. Usually just stat unit, though. Um, and worth, it, worth mentioning there is that you can actually call console commands at runtime in your game code by using execute console command function. Yep. Yep. And or that's very useful. Tight them to a key, um, yeah. you know, like one, two, or three, or something like that. And something you can do now in 422 that I've actually started working on is a editor utility widget that gives mm. you a visual representation. Because for game designers that don't need to dig into this too much, but they might, you know, have been told, hey, you know, keep an eye on your draw calls when you're designing your level. Instead of them remembering stat scene rendering, you can have a button that, you know, that sort of just says. Yeah, that looks at it and it's like, hey, you're, you've, you're starting to get too many objects, you know. Think about reusing or removing. That's pretty cool. Yeah, um, mainly then it's just easier to have a button uh, and and key binds. You forget them, right? It's it, it's hard to remember. Or I recycle them a lot. I'm like, oh wait, one doesn't work because I took that out. <laughs> oh, apparently Shift L also shows the print uh, prints on your screen, so you don't have to dig through console logs as well. Mm, oh, cool. that's really cool. That's why I love chat. Just helping us out, making everyone a more. <laughs> More Better efficient de developer. Yep, yep. And, uh, oh, where did you mention that you use it um, by default in the English, US, and I think English as well, editor, you use the tilde key. It's called tilde, right? Uh, it's called the back tick. Back key. tick, okay. Why do I refer to it as tilde? Oh, cause because it is it on this, same on this on keyboard, our keyboards, on the US yeah. keyboard, it, is a, it has the tilde above it, but tilde so is not a... Backtick is the actual name of the key. And that's what's assigned to the keybind uh, in editor. You can like in a German keyboard, it's like in between the the greater uh, the greater than and the less than and the question mark key, it's like right there. Yeah, and it was someone, I don't remember why I, I figured that out, that it wasn't the same across, because I was helping someone in Europe. Um, yeah, somebody on the I've been using American keyboards like, forever now. I don't have a tilde key, it's called a backtick key. Not everybody has US keyboards, and I was like, oh. I'm sorry. Sorry. <laughs> uh, but you can reassign that to a key that is more, uh, maybe in the same location. I actually don't yeah. know. 
what that would be on another on another keyboard, and that's really uh, quite useful. And digging into these and what what sort of all of these mean, we're almost getting into a little bit more performance and optimization here. Uh, but there are plenty of docs online of what all of the actual like stat groups here, and and, and yeah, what, what they are, mean. what you can find them useful for, and. Um, how they can be applicable to your project. Yeah, and if you if this is something you want to dig into, at the end of the slide, and I'll put the slide on the announcement post for uh, on our forums. I have a, uh, a quite quite a long list of videos and guides that are targeted towards this kind of stuff. So there's one about performance and optimization there, where they do go through a lot of these things. Cool. Next slide. All right. Next slide. Output log. It's also sort of bread and butter. Butter. I almost want to. Um, yeah. Let me. So. Um, oh, I thought I did an edit there. It's uh, only supposed to be one little there. Yeah, we're gonna go ahead and open it here for you, so you can go ahead and all right. So this take a is look the, at it. This is the output log right here. Um, we found out at the very last second that there's something's weird with this project, so I'm not going to be playing it because I have a feeling it's gonna crash when I do that. Um, but right here is basically where everything is gonna be. You can see like I don't have any encryption files here. If I go all the way actually up to the top. Uh, when you open up your log file inside of UE4, that is actually what you're mm -hmm. looking at. This is just what's going on inside of UE4 right now. Um, this is super useful because as you are, say you're connected, like say to my uh, my mobile device right here, I can actually see stuff, uh, what's going on kind of in the game. Uh, in my device, I'll get a little bit of information back in this window, not a lot just a tiny little bit. If I want to get more information about what's going on specifically on my device, um, and let me, let me take a step back and clarify that again. Um, so if I was launching this game and I was running it and it was like a PC game when I was playing on the mm -hmm. PC, I'm going to get a ton of information to this output log window. If I'm doing something like on a device like this, I'm going to get a minimal amount of information. Like I won't get any information from the actual device, like its battery levels, how hot it is, what Java commands it's running and things like that, right? To do that, I'd have to use something called uh, ADB log cat. It's a little complicated to set up and use um, way out of the, the realm of most people. So if you come here to window and you come down to developer tools, we actually have this uh, device output log, which is right here. So I'm gonna just dock this down here. And here I can select my device and I'm gonna go ahead and start a project really quick. So I'm just gonna start this AR project and you can see here, um, let me move my thing down and get it down to the bottom so that it auto-populates. And basically right now it's, it's trying to get the best GPS provider and GPS doesn't work when you're indoors. So, But the cool thing about this is that if I come over here to my command window, I can type in stat FPS, stat unit, stat memory, my memory is okay. And then what's going to happen is, and I don't know if you guys can <laughs> see that. Can we do some crazy? No, we need a manual zoom. Oh, yeah. Uh, 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 I can't reach. Um, <laughs> but basically what, what uh, oh, wait, I can put it back up there. There's a tiny little, you can see that we actually do see. <laughs> you guys can see that it's very tiny. Oh, here. oh Greg's there coming in here to help. Oh. Yeah, we're getting some. We broke the fourth wall. <laughs> All right, so hold on. That's fine. Watch this. Just keep it right there. So then I'm gonna type in stat none, and they're all gonna go away. Woo. Yay! Oh, just in time for it to get unblurry. So like, we'll do, this one. we'll do this one more time. Stat FPS. Ah. Uh. And there's a tiny little green green line there. And here we go, all of them. Oh. Now I wish it was like a five finger tap that was shift L, but on. There we go. And then we'll do stat, none. Yeah, and they're all gone. And they're all gone. So that's really cool because I'm doing this, at, like to normally put something in. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. Uh, to normally put something into this device, I have to do the four finger tap. And then I get the little command line window. And then, you know, recently we added uh, common console commands, which is pretty cool, but. This is still me, four finger tap. Okay, I got my FPS. Now let me put in my, uh, you know, let me put in my stat unit or whatever else I need to put in there. Then I want to get rid of this or I want to change it. And it's so simple to just do this inside of this window right here. Because I think I also have, uh, no, I don't. 
and you can use the up arrow, right, to uh, see all of your yeah, previous there we commands. Go. Yeah, that's what so I was looking for. Yeah. I use that all the time. And then another little thing I wanted to mention once, so if you're debugging uh, individual play sessions and you want to search for uh, maybe you have a prefix in your debug or something like that is BP underscore, because anything that's executed in um, print string in Blueprint will have BP, like the, the actual mm -hmm. name of the Blueprint, uh, the, the world context for that. Uh, I should make a note to bring. Uh, okay, because I can't remember all these things immediately. Um, and what I do then in, s in between each session to make sure that I'm actually only reading log from the previous session instead of trying to go and figure out where I started the next session is that you can right click inside the output log and then clear log. And that will just clear it. And it just makes, so now when you do your next play session, you will only have logs related to the previous play session in the editor. Your log file will still contain everything as far as I know. I don't think it split it up. No, I don't think you're, I, I, I think it saves everything out. So like you're making the log and mm -hmm. it saves it out to the log file. But I think this is just like, it just outputs it to this yeah. window. Um, so if you clear this, it's not going to clear what's in the file that's saved on Right. Oh, no, no. It's definitely not going to clear. Okay it's, okay. it's not deleting. But I was wondering if it split it up in between, like, separate log files. Could oh. you do that? Oh, that's I don't think it does. I don't, not out of the box. I, I don't so. remember ever, having, like, coming across that. So really useful and uh, something that I figured out after years. <laughs> and so it's nice to bring bring some of these things up in a while. Um, chat was asking if it works on iOS, and it does, yes, right? Yes, it works for iOS, mm -hmm. and it works for Android. Um, and it's 4.22 and beyond, I think. It might be in 4.21, but I think 4.21 it only worked with Android and not iOS. Um, uh, and the reason being, it's actually kind of funny, uh, the deployment server, the person checked in their log, so it was trying to write to a read-only file. So it kept crashing because you can't write to a read-only file. Okay. So as soon as we turned it to writable, the problem went away. So if your deployment server is crashing and you're trying to use the, the, the command thing on an iOS and it's just not working, make sure that your deployment server log file isn't set to uh, writable, or is set to writable, not read-only. It's good to know. All right. I feel like I would have been able to come across that at some point. All right, and now we're getting into a little bit of, so you've, you've done the initial steps, you prepared your project, you've commented everything, and the code you're iterating on is just not doing what you want it to. And the breakpoints is not specific to blueprints. They are common in C++ as well. That's where they come from. And essentially what breakpoints do is that you put a breakpoint in somewhere uh, in the execution chain of your logic and whenever that function is being called by your logic, the runtime will stop, and it will put focus on the um, the the function that you you the logic broke on. And at this point, you can now step like every single step in your execution flow. You can go through that. And we have a few since I think it's like four eight. 419 we received some a really nice update to this and so now we can do some very some things that are much more common in visual studio which is to uh, step in step over and step out essentially what that is when you step in if it's like if you put a breakpoint on a macro or a function if you step in you will actually step into that function you do want to see what's going on inside that function step over will just go to the next function or macro in your execution line and step out is if oh well, you only cared about the first half of logic that you had in your function, and you can now step out of that, and you know, take me to the the next thing that's supposed yeah. It's to like be if you had a couple of functions that were nested, and the problem was in the second function, mm -hmm. and went to it. You're like, okay, that's fine. I'm gonna step out back to where I was at the top level. Is kind of what that does, or that's been my experience with it. I'm sure there's probably someone who's like, no, it actually does this, but that's my understanding of it anyway. <laughs> and. Uh, I was going to say something there, but I, I oh, I'm sorry. Lose space. I, I nope, totally nope. You're good. You're good. Next slide. That's right. as easy, as, easy slide. as that. Uh, we have something called the Blueprint Debugger, and I am not a hundred percent on this, but I I really wanted to bring it up because I've seen seen it being used in some very very efficient ways. And the Blueprint Debugger in 4.22, uh, maybe 4.21 as well, but this is what it looks today. Uh, you will be presented with three tabs, which is call stack, watches, and execution flow. And I think what I find really useful here is, is the call stack. And I'm making a little reference of how we can 
even get deeper into that. But the call stack will display the entire call stack that occurred when your breakpoint was hit. And so that means the, the logic that was executed right prior to that breakpoint, right? Saying that right? Yeah. And uh, a really useful thing here is that you can also manually print this. And so the little function node that we have on, on, on screen up there is called stack trace. That will actually print that call stack into your output log and your log file as well, which is really useful when you're digging into something that's just not working, you don't know why, and you need as much information as possible about what's going on. I tend to drop that stack trace in there. Especially, I think I've used it a lot when also when doing multiplayer because it's harder to... It, when, when I'm doing multiplayer, it's easier to go back afterwards and sort of read mm -hmm. through your logs. And so I try to be really detailed, and that's why I mentioned before, I put print strings before something happens, after something happens, if it was successful, if it failed. And then adding a stack trace there when you're digging into something that, that's hard will gi just give you more information about what happened there. Uh, not a good tip there in the same same vein is to try to um, not necessarily collapsing but using functions and, and macros as much as possible where it makes sense because when you do hit a stack trace and it prints it's not just going to say like ed um, editor like it, it will just give you so oh, it was somewhere in this event graph and it will give you an ID that I haven't really figured out how to track down yet mm -hmm. and so if you have it in a macro you'll see oh it broke in the macro or oh it broke in this function ah, and, okay. and at least then you can you can track down where it's happening and you have less of an area of logic to troubleshoot and figure out where things are going wrong. The second one is watches and if you've ever, uh, so let's bring over the editor, yeah, and we can show you how to enable this. I, I see you have some going on there already. Like watch this value. Yeah, you can watch this value. And it will work. I'm, I don't want to run the project because <laughs> it crashed when it auto-saved and I have no idea. I was just working on it before we came over here and I was like, hey, let me zip this up really quick and we'll show it because I've got, I mean, well, let me zoom out and I'll show you guys. This is so, I made this little AR image detection thing for the Raleigh EDU event, uh, Unreal Academy. Basically, you, you took it and you used it to detect some pictures of my dogs. And then I, I've been wanting to use the location services stuff where you get the GPS signal from your phone mm -hmm. and you can do stuff with it. So basically what, I, what, this, what this blueprint is doing is basically down here I've got some GPS coordinates and I'm trying to, I'm figuring out the difference between my current latitude and longitude versus like these spots that are in our parking lot. Mm -hmm. And then if it's greater than, um, if one's uh, less than the other one, then that means that I'm in that area. So I'm going to uh, run this little, I have a little multi-gate bool multi here. And then basically you'll do that. It's, I'm working on spawning this. It doesn't spawn in the right spot. I think it's because my math is I'm using the wrong type of degree in my, um, uh, my sign um, formula, my math expression node. Which Sam Rubber Ducking, by the way. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, and then we basically we spawn a little uh, mesh in the world where the thing is. So once you get there, um, you scan the image, and then if you do it four times, it says, "Hey, you win." It, it's on event tick, so it's like. Doo -doo 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 -doo. So what I did is I let it go for about a second, which prints a bazillion things to the line, <laughs> and then I just stopped ticking the okay. actor. And then I uh, basically remove all the widgets or remove the UI, and then I just like recall my startup code over here to add the UI again. So basically, and when I re-add this UI, this UI is set up, basically reinitiates its entire self. So I didn't have to like reinitiate everything on event begin play, it just tick starts all over again, mm -hmm. so the game restarts. Um, and this down here, so this is the append node that he was talking about. This basically, so I needed to know, and the reason is, is because I was testing on my phone and one, the phone can't be connected to my computer. And even if it was connected to my computer, there's still no way for me to pull off, like, like look at my graph and see exactly what's going on. Like, I can't, that, that's just not possible on mobile debugging with UE4. So what I had to do is get super clever with my print string. So like on this one, I wanted to make sure that uh, work one, its value, true or false. And I did this for, you know, work two, work three, and work four. Um, I also, then I came over here and I'm like, work one set to true, work two set to true. So I could tell, uh, throughout my flow, like 
did I actually make it to the right place? And did I set the var variable that I need to be there? Um, over here, what I'm doing is basically, um, this is my get location is, this is my, where I'm getting the signal from my GPS. And then here, what I'm printing on my screen is basically my latitude and longitude and my altitude. And this horizontal accuracy is just basically my accuracy for how accurate my tracking is. Um, I'm printing these, let me go over to my viewport. I, uh, I just do this through a bunch of text. This is just easier for me to do than through uh, a UMG widget. Um, I could have done it through a UMG widget. I have another project that does it through UMG. This is just, I started working and I'd get one little part to go and eventually when I'm done it all, I'll go back into UMG. But um, all of this stuff right here is uh, color coded too. So like your horizontal accuracy will go green when it's really good or red when it's really bad. Um, the hint text will change red if you haven't found something, green if you're in the area, or yellow if you're in the area, green if you're ready to take a capture. Um, your altitude changes color based on how high you are, so it's like really dark blue if you're at zero or negative, and okay. then white as you, goes too white as you get higher, like, you know, because like the clouds are super high. Um, latitude and longitude don't change anything, neither does timestamp. But um, the reason that I did that is I wanted to make sure that uh, Having the, the like, um, this guy right here, the tracking, the horizontal accuracy, having all of this stuff in red, it, it's just red. The reason I chose red is because it was actually super easy to show up in the AR. Like, white and black were not showing up. Black okay. would either be too dark sometimes, and white would be too dark sometimes, if that can make any sense, because there's light estimation going on. And I found out that red actually reads the best. Red and green read the best for whatever reason, uh, when bright environments. Um, but I found that making the stats color coded mm -hmm. so that I could tell like, oh, I could immediately turn it on and I wouldn't even have to look at the number. I could just tell like, oh, my tracking sucks. I have to let me get out of the building and restart the app, start the app. Okay, my tracking's green. Okay. Okay, perfect. All right. I know that it's tracking the way that it needs to be. So like that's one thing that I don't have to worry about this this run through. And then as I start to press the buttons and figure out like, you know, here... Um, so it's not, he, it's, it says hello, but, uh, usually you can see this is my first thing, my event begin play. It's literally the first thing I have because I want to make sure that I'm actually doing something. Um, because I know that it's working, I have it disconnected from there. Um, but here, what I'm doing, I'm taking my longitude, my latitude and my altitude. I'm literally printing them out right here. The first thing I'm doing, I'm figuring out what my default values are, printing them out to make sure, um, you know, see what info is going into them. Um, this thing's kind of cool right here. So one of the issues with debugging stuff is a lot of times you it's hard to debug maybe on your source platform phones or let's say the Oculus uh, Quest, for mm -hmm. example. How the hell are you supposed to debug on a mobile platform that's not attached to anything to your computer, right? You could send it over the air. Um, uh, what's it? The Android Codeworks allows to do that, but it's okay. very slow. Um, so how do, I, how do I debug something when it's on my device versus the PC? Or what if I have some logic that can only work on one, but I need to, I need to build the logic and test it to make sure that it actually mm -hmm. functions, but how do I do that? So what I did here is we have this nifty little node called git platform name. And actually what I did is I did a little like this. I did a print. Yeah, I've I did a print string before. and I plugged this guy into here and then I ran the game and this actually shows up in your log down here. So I was like, okay, so my platform name is Windows because I always call it PC for some reason. I always put in PC, it's called Windows. So basically, it's going to get the platform name and it's going to check. Does the platform name equal Windows? Well, if it does, we're going to say we're in Windows. If it doesn't, however, what we're going to do is we're actually going to run this code right here, which invokes our AR session. So it launches our AR, our, our start AR menu, and then the actual AR debug menu, which none of this stuff will work on PC because it doesn't have those DLLs. Right. It just, it just, it won't work at all. But what I'm doing for this is I go to a location, I tap. So what I can actually do is put in a number, press the one key, mm -hmm. and then run my logic and see if that see if I'm getting the result that I need, right? Then I press two, see if I get the result that I need. This is how I found out I had some, like every time I would go to my second point on my GPS, it would always turn true until I went to the third point. And then they'd both be true until I got to the fourth point, which would never actually activate. And it was because I'm not very good at vector math, uh, apparently. 
Uh, basically, it was because what I was doing was I was adding their value. So I was, I was checking to see if the current latitude and longitude were greater than the current or the where the spot is supposed to be. Mm -hmm. But if you look at it at like a grid like this, that means that on sp spots like two and three, they were always going to have the upper right hand corner was always going to be true because it's always going to be greater than than the value that was coming in. So what I needed to do was actually compare the two distances and then see if they are greater than a little threshold right here. Like I have this, you know, I'm seeing if this return value is greater than 0 0.00001. So if it is, then that means yes, I'm in the right location. Um, you know, again, trial and error. And this, uh, this right here, you can see this is my testing code over here. This is like, I will set this into my nodes because if my current latitude equals my current latitude, which would be zero, zero, because that's what it is when it first starts on PC, because there is no GPS on your PC. Mm -hmm. This is, I know, like, I'll plug this into, you know, my, my first bool right here, and then I'll be able to fire that off, and I'll see somewhere down here, like, okay, so that, you know, and I used to have a print statement right here that would say, setting this variable, and then after this, actually, you can see I have it right here, spawned. So now, because this thing doesn't spawn in the right location in the world, I added spawn right here because I don't know if it's actually spawning or not. I've seen it like two times, but depending on where I'm at in the real world, it, um, it might not show up because it might be like super far away that's getting cold. So I just, I need that verification that it's actually spawning. So that again, put spawn right here. So I know, yes, this definitely did spawn something and it also definitely set uh, work one to true so I know that's working, and then right over here, what it's basically doing is it's printing out um, this uh, work that it set the work to true. So I know that I'm at the work spot, I know that it's spawning the object, and I know that it set the variable to true, signifying that this area has been reached. So I know all of that stuff happened, and I know all of that because it printed it to my log mm -hmm. using all the print string stuff. So um, if and you're so asking for this project, it is not ready to go out. <laughs> It's very, very experimental. It's so experimental that it doesn't actually work on this computer. I did want to mention that this is all done in 4.22, and so all, yeah. the, all the features of GPS location that you're using to make this yep. exist. Yep. It's, it's all of the, the so you need to come here to your edit, and I know this is not off topic. Uh, what we were talking about, but um, it's called location services. All right, so there's an iOS implementation for it. And there is a Blueprint library, and there's an Android implementation for it as well. Um, and like the major differences between the two is basically, where did it go? On my node here, this. So on Android, we have return horizontal accuracy, while on iOS, you have return vertical accuracy. That's like the main difference between the two systems. Okay. Uh, in terms of like Blueprint functionality, I'm sure there's some stuff that Apple does behind the scenes, I, I just don't know about because I don't do any real hardcore Apple development. Few of us game designers do, I think. <laughs> just but a few. thankfully, there are some very smart people making sure that we can make all of this. All right, so, uh, oh, and someone, someone's bringing up as well that it's like it's, it's, more, it's more debugging than actual, actual logic. And yes, that's true. That's, it's quite common, uh, especially when you're- It used to be even more to get me to this point, to try to figure out how it, I'd, I was sitting down with Tom Shannon, and he's, I was explaining to him what was going on, and we went to the whiteboard, and we were actually drawing it out, and then it dawned on him, because he has some experience with this from the uh, uh, enterprise, enterprise mm -hmm. world, about what's going on with, with GPS, and I have no experience with GPS, so what I was doing was right, and it made total sense, but someone who has a little bit more experience in like vector math and, and surface topology, you know, you're like, oh, you have to compare the distance between the two points, and you know, I need to get this precise value. So it's, it's, um, it, no matter how much debugging I did, um, you know, I was able to explain. To, I, let me take that back. I was only able to explain to him what was going on because I had done all of this debugging because I knew the exact numbers. I knew exactly how far they were apart from each other. I knew which ones would go true when the other ones were going true, and being able to give him that much information after we kind of plotted it all out. Mm -hmm. He's like, oh, it's doing this. We verified that's exactly what it was doing. We wrote, like, it took me, I've been working on this for like pretty much all week and most of last week. Um, it took about 10 minutes to build this little section right here, just these nodes like this. 
and basically copy it all down to the rest of my points, and boom, it works flawlessly now. But I would have never been able to express to him why it was being why it was breaking and not working if I hadn't done all of the print string debugging that I had done to, to basically get my case, figure out what was going on. Yeah, and that, that boils down to how, you know, it eventually if you come across something that might actually be an engine bug, and you, we, and, you know, we don't have your use case, right? And so if for our engineers to look into it, you almost have to do your due diligence at that point and provide us with... There is with um, uh, you know precise steps on how to get to the same problem or, or, or status of, of of your logic that you have, and that's really one of one of the only like we we need basically all of that information to be able to get to that so we can see the same problem and then we can try to figure out what's going wrong. Well, people are probably going to roast me for saying this. Um, it's very rare that you're going to come across a straight engine bug mm -hmm. with as much testing as goes into stuff. I'm not saying that we write bug-free code <laughs> and that there aren't definitely engine bugs and the there are definitely engine bugs in there, but they are far fewer than I think people are led to think about. Mm -hmm. I, I think there are actually it's more stuff with there might be something with your logic or something with the way that you have things set up or permissions on your PC than actual b a bug inside of the code because it goes through a pretty heavy QA process. And again, that's not to say that, hey, there isn't a bug in the code, but if you do find a bug in engine code, the more information you can give yep. means that that bug is going to get solved sooner. Um, you know, because we get bug reports mm -hmm. and there's a, there's like this really weird bug crash that's on DirectX uh, 12 or DirectX 11. It's like some driver hang crash. It yep. happens all the time, but it's, it's different for each computer. Um, each it's GPU. really, really hard to track down exactly what happens because it's different for each computer, each GPU, each setup. Um, but if we had, you know, okay, on this GPU, I do these exact steps and it happens like this, I'd make it a little bit easier for us to kind of track that stuff down and figure out, um, you know, what is causing the issue. Um, but again, there are tons of, there are, there are engine bugs in there. I just don't think there's as many as people are like, most of the time I automatically see like the flag that will come by is like blueprint doesn't compile. There must be an issue with your branch node in the engine. And it's like, well, I understand that you it's not working in your project, but I have millions of hours of data to back up that the branch node does in fact work, you know? Um, so that's just one thing to be, and if it doesn't work, then yeah, the more information you provide, the better. And if you do go through sort of the thorough process of trying to figure out what's going on, you will save yourself time um, instead of going back and forth between engine support. And you might you know, solve it today instead of waiting for a response that, oh, no, it was not an engine bug. And then you still have to go through all those steps again. Yeah. Um, so yeah. it saves all this time. Uh, to continue, let's see, I did add a little note here. Yep, yep. Let's head over to viewport show flags. And I think the best way to it's just to show this in the editor. Um, I don't have a map here. Oh, because it's... Hold on, <laughs> let me see. Hold on. Let's, should we maybe open the... Let's, let's try this. We'll see if this is actually going to work. Nope. <laughs> okay. Let's, let's, let's open ball rail. Here we go. Uh, hold on one second. Need a launcher. Yeah. Then a quick note that I... I wrote Wait. down earlier. Oh, hold on. Oh, it's, it's already running? Okay, great. Oh, everything. Oh, it's <laughs> everything's in the same menu. I'm like, I'm just going to close the menu <laughs> down and yeah. That's, I think that's my menu. menu. Yeah, it is. Okay, great. Uh, I was doing some testing here as well, uh, just earlier. All right, so we should be fine in here. Stat none. Great command. You can pretty much pick um, uh, blueprint. Level. Yeah, so. Um, Yep, that's the one. All right. If you watched the stream a few weeks ago, you saw me and Tom Shannon working in this. It's just a little, little interesting um, test project that I'm working on. And uh, visualization view modes. Yeah, so if we go to lit there and then optimization view modes, mm -hmm. this is where you can see uh, shaded complexity, I'd say, is the one that I use the most by everything. And you can see here that everything is really, really, really good because it's all uh, opaque materials. There's no translucency whatsoever in this scene. We can go, yeah, quads is good as well because that will actually allow you. So when there are quads that are sort of overlapping, that will actually, I think it's an exponential cost to. So your GPU works on like a two by two granularity 
And as triangles start to get smaller and smaller than two by two, your GPU has to basically say it's working in like a little square inch by a square inch and you have a bunch of triangles in there, it has to do a bunch of work to fill mm -hmm. in all of those triangles. This is actually also super important when you're using the forward renderer, not so much in the deferred renderer, but in the forward renderer, because of basically it's going through and iterating on every single pixel. It's not taking all the stuff and putting it together kind of like layers inside of Photoshop. Uh, the smaller your, your, your uh, quads get, especially in far away distant objects, the more computational power it takes to actually render that geometry because it just doesn't like to work with really tiny triangles. Okay. Um, so this is basically when you're looking at the quad view mode like this, this is not so great. So what I what this signifies is that uh, on this piece for the last LOD or whatever LOD, I need to make sure that I'm like flattening the geometry out mm -hmm. or trying to reduce the amount of red. Um, and with all of these view modes, it's not about being all green. It's about isolating and reducing red whenever is whenever possible. Yeah, it's not like an accurate number of how much this costs. It's it's relative to yeah, because the pixel could literally cost. Well, it could cost ten here, twenty here. But I move back now. It's thirty because all of a sudden I had a VFX that wasn't there before going go in front of me, you know, a transparent one goes in front for that split second. So uh, this is just a good, like, instead of like, you know, hey, uh, I want you to go find the new world. It's like, hey, I want you to go find the new world, and I need you to head in this direction. Right. And then the other one I wanted to point out was the uh, show collision flag, which is a great way to debug, like, why can't I not walk here? It seems like an invisible wall. And uh, I only know how to do this by hitting Alt C. <laughs> it's third from the top. Is it? Is yeah. It? Show ah, collision. Okay. Yeah. Alt C. There's another key bind, and that will actually display all of the uh, the mesh collision that you. This is really good, especially by when you're a uh, new UE4 uh, uh, or, or you're new to UE4. Uh, one of the things that I see is people that import a bunch of stuff and forget that by default we'll automatically apply collision. So they'll spawn in and all of a sudden they can't spawn or they can't walk through their door mm -hmm. or they can't walk through the window or they're on their mountain, but they're like this high above the mountain or whatever. And it's because, you know, collision was automatically generated for that. So yeah, hitting a uh, Alt C or going to the show tab and showing your collision. Um, that's super, super useful because it will then show you why you cannot. Um, I had a UDN from a pretty high a uh, high-end customer, and they were like, I can't get this to work. We've been trying everything. Like, they went to Blueprints. They were looking at stuff in C++. They couldn't figure it out. And I, I'm like, okay, you know, give me your project. Show me your repo. I'm able to do it. And, like, literally the first thing I did is I opened it up, and I pressed Alt-C, and then I grabbed all of the meshes, and I disabled their collision. And then I walked right through them, and I explained to them what, what they did and why it wasn't working. Mm -hmm. And they felt kind of dumb, but it was... They felt better when I reassured them. That I'm like, this is a mistake everybody yeah. makes when they're first using the engine. So like, it bites everybody in the butt eventually. But I, you'll never forget it, and it'll always be the first <laughs> thing that you look for when you're trying to debug. Like, yeah, oh, let's just let's check out the collision. Yeah, and it can be tricky. I tend to, as long as I'm not actually doing sort of visual pretty nice level design, I tend to leave it on, just because I might catch something before it, I'm even playing, and I can see that it's. This is going to be a problem, and I can remedy it before before we're even there. Cool. Let's let's keep going. Um, head over to the next slide, Mr. Keyboard Operator. So this bl uh, this topic of blueprint automation um, automation it are ways that you can set up test code. So essentially, it allows the computer to run through some of the logic that you've set up without you actually having to play the game or, or someone else on your team that's testing it. And we actually have support for automation in Blueprints. We are not going to go through it on the stream because, once again, there's already really good content on it. But I wanted to make sure that we bring it up because this is part of sort of the, the prepare step of, of how to debug because it can be really simple to just accidentally flip a bool, something that I do quite frequently, and I, I'm, I'm mad about myself every time, is that when I'm doing VR development, I have a bool in my player controller class that depicts whether I should spawn a flat pawn, which is mouse and keyboard or controller, or the actual VR pawn. And one of the automation tests that I set up is when I package, and this is especially for Quest, since it, you can't play mouse and keyboard on Quest, I, I, I have an, uh, a Blueprint automation script that makes sure that that bool is set to true. Because <laughs> I will toggle it off while I'm working, Mm. And 
mm. and this will actually be the automation test will run part of your packaging process if you are using the project launcher and you can uh. enable uh, automation there and you can use automation to do tons of stuff um we use it to test the editor functionality mm -hmm. like behind the scenes but you can do it to test like uh, basically you can automate it so some your game could start they could click in click on your start button start the game play through the entire game uh, you know get x get a certain number of kills or collect a certain number of potions or run a certain number of miles yeah. or do whatever like it's a very powerful system and it saves you so much time because especially if you've written some of the core logic your base classes you can have automation tests to make sure that they work and then no one actually have to go back and um and in three months when you discover that there was a problem back there your automation test would already have or yeah. hopefully have caught that and you would be able to remedy that I, immediately I know we have a uh, we do heavy automation testing with the renderer um we have like a that scene with the boxes and the, mm -hmm. the different colors and it spits out an image um so that you can trace Basically, the engine makes a compile, and it f loads up this scene, captures an image, spits it out, so you can compare to make sure that things aren't broken over time. Because it's very easy for, especially as your project grows and you start to add more and more developers, for something little to break somewhere uh, and go unnoticed for a little while. And then all of a sudden, when it does go noticed, it's usually because it's causing some big problems. So... This is good to make sure that uh, you catch stuff early and on and get a fix in for it as soon as possible. I am grabbing the link here, uh, which I've actually paused it, or the YouTube link is set straight to when Shord is talking about how to do this mm. from his um, that should be good uh, blueprints in depth uh, talks, which they're part of the guide at the end. You should watch them. Everyone should watch them. There's, I tweeted about it. It's some of the best. Uh, one of the best presentations I've seen when it comes to working with blueprints in, in Unreal Engine. Um, and yeah, like we mentioned, it reduces load on QA and testing because this is automatically run. No one has to manually actually play the game uh, when you have set up automation, something that I'm definitely starting to dig in a lot more and, and just doing this because I know that even if I work just a few weekends, some of these simple things, it will save me time. It's totally worth it. Let's go next slide. Oh. And uh, log files. No matter how, you know, everything runs well when you're working in editor or, or say like you did clear the log like we mentioned earlier and now you do want to go back and see what actually happened there. You're going to want to head over to... Oh, I went one folder to though. Here we go. Yep. Logs. Logs. And there it is. Is that from today it is? Yeah, that's from today. And so yeah. this is the file path if you want to read a log of what happened in editor, that file path um, will obviously be different because when you've packaged a development, a development build for your project, the log file will not exist inside your, your, your project files. It will be part of the folder, um, the file path for your game and where yeah, your game it'll, sits. It'll be, in your, it'll be in a saved folder, but in your game mm -hmm. folder. Um, it actually will be in this similar location um, well, it's not going to, when you go into it, it's not going to have all this stuff. It'll have like saved files, images, and logs, I think. It does not have a lot of information in there. Um, and then I think that was actually my slide. Oh, oh, yep. I did add a little one last minute here because I did want to bring it up. And we have mentioned it quite a few times throughout the stream as well. And it's when you're debugging VR, things are a little bit different because reading some of the screen display messages it works fine when you're on a flat yeah, monitor yeah, printing screen you have to read it with one eye one eye and it's sort of up there and i've done a bunch of like i ha i used to do a macro that had like 30 enters and uh like 22 spaces <laughs> um like as the first part in the append and then i would i would actually print it so that it was it moved like sort of straight into my eye it's funny that you just can't move it down like the uv you have to it was never. It was not uh, originally designed. You know, there was no stereoscopic HMDs. Yeah, no, 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 no. Makes total for sense. For a few years ago. So, <coughs> excuse me. A better system for that that I I tend to build is to have a little little three D widget that has that can dynamically add uh, text text to it, and, and and I usually have a little scroll bar there as well. And then what I'll do is that I'll set up a macro in a macro library that will not only print a string, 
but it will also, if I want to, if I toggle that bool, it will also add a line of text to the widget. And this is a 3D widget that I usually attach to one of the motion controllers. You can have it as part of, you know, uh, stuck to the, the, the VR camera as well, but I really like to have them on my hands because they can go out of my view and, and then I can open it up or like thumbsticks down or menu button or even have a, if you do have your main menu on your, on your hand, you can have a button there that sort of opens your, your mm. custom output log and you can move that around and change it to your liking and you can be even smarter maybe and even have separate ones, like one is for performance, one is for gameplay, one is for damage, you know all those things, but just a nice little tip of how I tend to deal with that. And then the other, w other thing that I do a lot, because in VR it's, it's, it's all very visual and sometimes you're working with very small units and it can be hard to even see if they're correct in your logic if you're just printing. And so I like to use uh, meshes, arrows, colliders of all kinds. And just since I know that they're only for debugging and I guess it matters a little bit here if, if you're doing it in sort of a development build or not, but I like to toggle the editor-only button as just a little mm, yeah, small a performance gain that you're not actually going to load, you're not going to have collision on these things. Uh, and what that means is that they, if you're playing in a, uh, in a build, they, they don't exist. They're only for editor, uh, only for editor logic. And uh, I tend just as a nice little tip there to not get confused over these things, because it might be new, I always, always, always name those components editor underscore only. And that is to give me a clear representation, like, why am I not seeing this box in the build? Oh, it's editor only. Also good if you're several people working on the same project, someone else opens up your class, they just see a mesh there, they want to use it for whatever reason, and they package the, the package the build and they play it and it's just not there. Yeah, they don't know that, oh, you shouldn't be using that mesh because it doesn't actually show up. Yeah, and not, you know, you're not going to go through every single component in an actor just to see which ones have been toggled at. So, code is for humans, be clear um, for other humans and yourself, and it will help you down the line. And then the last part is just a few links to a couple of uh, we got our style guide. There's a lighting troubleshooting guide that is absolutely fantastic when you're having problems with shadows and lighting. And then a few more videos that I find extremely useful if you want to uh, go a little bit deeper into some of, the, some of the topics that we've talked about here today. I will go ahead and put this slide up on the forum post as soon as we're done with the stream, I promise. And you'll be able to check them out. They're also, I believe, all of these are actually available on the uh, Unreal Engine YouTube page. Oh. That is pretty much everything Excuse that me. I had. Oh, no, you're good. Like, it, it's long. They're comfortable, comfortable seats that no, we're sitting in here. I've been sleeping so hard this week. It's been <laughs> so hard to get up. Uh, yeah, we, we're preparing for our summer break, aren't we? Yeah, I know. Yep. I know. Today's actually my last day. I'm going to Florida tomorrow. I'm going to drive nice. down there. The car full of dogs and a wife. It's going to be a fun time. Sounds like fun, and yeah. I'm sure it's going to be warm, just like it is over it's here gonna right now. It's going to be nice and humid. So yeah. Like, might as well swim down there. <laughs> <laughs> and since we're on that topic, um, actually, we do have, oh, I almost completely bowled over uh, questions, because we I do want to go through all the ones that we actually have received here. Uh, I've been too engaged in this today, so I haven't been able to read any yet. So let's see if I can um, grab a couple. Let's see. Is there a built-in way to add variables to the print string node, or is using the format text node the main way? To is there a built-in way to add variables to the print string node? I think they mean is there a built-in way to print, you know, what the status of that variable is, or, or the data that it um. that it contains. Um, why don't we show them like the append node and how you can, you know, pipe in floats and ints and bools and. Did I close the? Maybe you did. No, I didn't. It's right here. Oh, okay. Um, you can go. Let's just open up the level. Blueprint. Level blueprint. Classic. And we'll drop a little print. And then our our precious append. It's being used all the time. And even though, so so s string data type string, there are several other types of data that it will know what it is and it will actually print the value of it. And so, yeah, you can't do that. <laughs> I, I do that all the time as well. And it will automatically, boom, uh, convert that bool into oh, string. I want to do this like this because I want to be like... So... What should happen now when I press play? 
Um, hold on. Maybe I need to actually press play. I don't see my thing going out here. Um, All right, are we printing it? Or is the mouse control in the way? <laughs> it's gonna be fun seeing Sam trying to play. Yeah. Did it execute? I don't know. Is it in the persistent? Because if it's not in persistent, it might not be loaded. Um. Yeah, it's in persistent, right? Yeah. Want to make sure that we're in the right level that we're trying to execute the logic in. Let's just come up here. We'll go to levels again. Uh, we need live. It should just be level design test. It should be the one we're in. Trying to show the <laughs> one of the easiest little I know <laughs> little pieces of the logic that we can can come across. Ah, uh, okay. So it wasn't a different level. Was it? Or is it because we reloaded it and didn't save? Oh no, hold on, let's see. Nope. Is it because it's starting in like four player? Maybe. We can disable that, but that that shouldn't shouldn't cause an issue. It should definitely be in our output log. Yeah. Uh so it's it's set up completely dynamic dynamically in game logic, so you yeah. won't be able to toggle it there. There you go. Level design test, hello. Oh. Log, log blueprint user messages. Okay, so it's being printed in. It was it was right up above. Oh, okay. Yeah, so it's working there. So we can go ahead and add the append. And I think you already saw it. But um, to answer the question there, you you can use floats, bools, ints, uh, text converts to string. Yeah. And uh, as the user there mentioned, you can use format text. You know, at first when you're working with text oh, data type. Silly, silly. But for print string, you're gonna have to convert it into into the data data type of string. My bool. There was a question here about VR. I, I, I think we we did touch a little bit about that. Um, let me know if you have some more questions about that in the forum post. I, I love VR and I do a lot of VR development. So if you have any questions on that, feel free to um, type them on the announcement post for the stream and I'll, I'll make sure to answer them if I can. Uh, I am f we don't have time to show bottlenecks in the session front end, unfortunately. Um, we can brief I can briefly mention that looking for, for ticks there. Um, you usually have to go down a couple of, of steps in the hierarchy. Oh, there it is. Value You'll is false. Find that. Value is false. All right. So and That's this logic right here. It literally is just like the value is space my rule, and then we see the value is false. And again, remember I put a space right there so that the false is not right butted up against um, the is, just to make it a little easier to read. Mm -hmm. And then how I found this, also don't forget, you can come in here and search for stuff in your log. This makes it really easy if you've like, you're like, oh, did I just see a red warning? And you're like, I don't know. There were a couple. Same with error, which I don't think oh, we yeah, have yeah, any. Yeah, no, no, I meant, of course I meant to say an error, because uh, a warning is not a, there's not a problem, but an error. You see a bunch of red text, that means there's an error. Mm -hmm. But when this thing is printing, it's going like a million miles an hour, so it can be hard to find it. So yeah, just don't forget you can filter your log by stuff. So we did have a question on the um, on the announcement post, um, sort of about multiplayer and, and and tips on debugging multiplayer. And we were talking about it a little bit. It's definitely harder, or there, there there's a little bit more more. Pre preparation there, at least yeah. from my experience, I have to prepare my logic a lot um, more for that. I've never debugged anything multiplayer in Blueprint before, so I can't really comment too much on it because um, I just don't have any experience with it. Um, what I can say is that you're mostly testing in in development builds, and because of that, you don't have the output log, right? You actually have to open up the log file and read it while you're playing. And so, what I tend to do there is to add as as much strings as possible everywhere. For anything that I want to be aware of, when it happened, what happened, I'm trying to prepare all the log as much as possible f so that when I do come across something that's, uh, that breaks, and it does, then it's easier for me to go back and read the log and figure out what actually happened there. Uh, 
do we have to add a breakpoint to see the watch values we've added because I can never see them any time e because I can never see them every time so this is why I mentioned that I'm trying to figure out the yeah. watch values section of the blueprint debugger um, I just started digging into that yesterday because uh, I have seen it used uh, and yes I believe you do need to put a breakpoint there to see it but I, I swear I've seen someone using that in real time. It's not like the uh, your blackboard for, for AI where you you know you can always see all the values in the blackboard changing in real time there, but I believe it's supposed to work very similar. Yeah. Uh, we tried to get it to work yesterday, but yeah. I didn't have time. What you can do, do though is that when you do the right click on the um, on the input or output and you watch it, you if that's a a, a flow like a, an alpha that's going from zero to one and back and forth, you can see that printed in real time if you're looking at the actual event graph. Yeah, yeah, you can. I think this just makes it easier to see a bunch of variables together doing their thing instead of like, I have to go to this one, so I have to move over here and then back down over there. And yep. All right, I think that that's it for today's stream because we're almost at an hour and a half now and I definitely want to I have a, a little announcement to make for our, our community out there we as we mentioned uh, Epic is going on summer break we get two weeks to in my case I get to work on some projects and <laughs> Sam's going to Florida I don't know what Greg's doing but I hope he's gonna have a good time yeah um, I, I'm sure most of us are gonna try to have a good time anyway and for these two weeks we are announcing a, uh, a small Competition, I guess, mm. is the best way to best way to put it. Um, an event, an event. Uh, it's Tim's words. Um, and so, to make sure I get all the details right, we're gonna kick off a month-long event where we're putting you in the director's chair. We have named this event Cinematic Summer. Can we, is it coming? I thought it would be like beautiful time, and I was making a whole build-up to like when the. The cinematic summer. Oh, oh it's that's, on that screen that's, down there. Okay, we. Uh, so all right. So all of our use, uh, all of you can see it. We're doing cinematic summer, which is a month-long event. Uh, where, like I said, we're putting you in the director's chair, and what we would like you to do, if you would like to join, is to create a short cinematic using sequencer that is no longer than three minutes and tells a story about summer. Um, and some of the tips here that Tim. Tim was kind enough to write up for us is maybe you had an adventure hiking through the wilderness or spent the summer at a cabin in the mountains and you would like to eternalize that uh, maybe in an, um, it could, could be interactive if you want to but that's, that's, I'm just mentioning that because I think that's where I would go once I'd, I built the scene uh, but this is just cinematic a nice cinematic piece um, and it can be yeah something about summer where you can pull that from your, your creative mind um, we'd love to see it, and of course, there, there we want to have an incentive for you to to do this. And so we will be raffling out uh, three Unreal Engine branded DX Racer chairs to Ooh, anyone who participates cool. and actually submits one. So it's similar to our sweepstakes that we do in our game jams, where anyone who participates and sends us a submission uh, will be part of the sweepstake. Uh, there is no limit to your team size. This is a very free and open creative event that we would like you to participate in and maybe advance some of your skills. When it comes to using sequencer, um, I should definitely do that. I think I'd like to <laughs> get my my mind around sequencer a little bit a little bit better. Um, yeah, and so I think we'll be kicking off a few tweets, and there will be um, a submission form at some point. Um, I actually don't have a date for when this starts, but I believe that it will start right now. Is when it starts. Actually, <laughs> this today is today is when it starts. I should probably have had that in my notes. That would have been better. <laughs> and it could be have been like, today is the cinematic summer. So it's a month-long event from today. Uh, excited to see what you all come up with. It's, it's great to see everything that comes through. Um, that includes the game jam. And, and now we're trying to do something different. Because, like I said, we'll be out for two weeks. There won't, unfortunately, be any live streams during these two weeks. But uh, feel free to hit me up on Discord if, if you want to chat or have any questions or problems. And I'm sure some people will be monitoring elsewhere as well but definitely a little a little less we all we're all going to take a nice summer break and then we're going to come back um i do have streams for the three weeks after after our break which involves quixel is coming we actually have uh mm. galen from quixel showing cool. up here in the studio it's going to have awesome. that seat right there going to talk about rebirth week after that we actually have uh, side effects and the houdini team coming on uh, to talk a, a little bit about their work and then there will be we're actually going to have wes on um Wes Bond is going to come on and Sweet. talk about um, artificial intelligence and some of the work mm. that he's been doing recently. Nice. He did all the he did all the AI for action RPG. 
He did, and yeah. I believe that maybe that was some of the the start of the some of the stuff that he's been working. Yeah, on yeah, now. we're they were overhauling all the the AI docs. That section needed some desperate love. So that's great. He's going to be our guy for that, and he will come on here and talk about that. And then, as always, make sure you fill out the survey that Amanda was kind enough to link in chat. Let us know what you thought of today's stream, uh, any topics you'd like to see going forward. I try to read that and, and, and pick. Uh, I did have a mention about C++ debugging, and I definitely want to get an engineer here so that we can go through that a little bit more in depth. Um, and then I'm hoping that we can add some, uh, yeah, generally about Visual Studio, how to work with it, um, and possibly even, you know, there, there are other tools when it comes to usually more performance and such, but there are other tools that you can use to track down like much lower level problems that if you're a rendering engineer and such, or, or you maybe have a friend that is a rendering engineer, you can send the log to him. And so some of the stuff I would love to go over in the future, hopefully we'll get there this year. Make sure you are uh, visiting meetups if there are any in, in, your, in your city. Uh, next week we actually have the Unreal Engine meetup here in, in Raleigh. Mm. So if, you have your, if you're around, please come hang out with us, bring your project, and uh, show us all the cool stuff you're working on. I'm going to bring a little, little quest demo that I've been working on. Um, and as always, uh, our online communities exist out there for, for you so that you can talk to other developers, help each other solve problems, figure out what's going well, what's going not so well, or just generally talk about Unreal and development. Because there's so much you learn. Like That's why I, I used to enjoy really listening to the live streams. I, I would have them in my car when I was driving to work and uh, just to get you know the discussion going and, and your brain to start thinking about everything Unreal because there's a lot, so much to it. <laughs> More than I think any single person can actually retain and remember. I don't know, you have more experience than I do um, in terms of working. I saw like all of your sample projects <laughs> that you built throughout the years. And that, that's quite, a, quite an impressive list there. Yeah, yeah, there's a lot, so. Yeah, and if you're streaming on Twitch, make sure that you add the Unreal Engine category so that we can tune in and say hi. And then follow us on social media. And as always, a big special thanks to all of you and all of our sponsors to make all this happen, especially DX Racer, since Cinematic Summer is happening. And uh, you might be one of the lucky few who get one of those. Without that, I will see you all in three weeks. That's how long it's going to be. I hope you all have a good summer. And take thanks for joining. Yeah, definitely thanks for joining. See you guys we'll next see you. time. Bye. Oh, my God. <laughs>